Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. You can remain standing. Jesus, thank you for your word. We're asking that you would continue to speak to our hearts, that you would continue to meet us right here in this place, and thank you that you meet us with your tenderness, with your mercy, with your grace. So even now, Lord, give us soft hearts. Give us minds that are open to you, ready to respond to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. You may be seated. Morning, everybody. Good to see you. Let's try it again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So good to see you. Listen, we're in a series called Encounters, and we've been working through John's gospel. And so if you're new here, if you've been around for a couple weeks, maybe you've caught it. We started it a few weeks ago, and we chose to walk through John's gospel because John, more than the other gospel writers, really focuses on these one-on-one individual encounters with Jesus. And John is also a bit of an artist in the way that he uses words and themes and stories. And so right out of the gate, we kind of get the sense that John wants us to hold two questions in front of us as we walk through reading his gospel. One of the questions is, who is this Jesus? And John knows, and he's told us in the prologue that Kendall read during worship this morning, John 1, it's called the prologue sometimes. And and, and he's told us that, but he wants us to see other people start to get their eyes open and begin to see who Jesus is. But the other question that John wants us to hold on to as we read his gospel is the question deep inside of us, what are you looking for? What is it that you're longing for? And then to find how actually these two questions meet one another in Jesus, that when we see who Jesus is, we see that he's the one we've been looking for. A few weeks ago when we began the series, Ben Simonson talked about Jesus calling these first disciples to him. So Jesus calls them, they ask him a question, he says, come on, follow me. And then the week after that, we talked about Jesus and Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is a person who comes to Jesus in the the, the middle of the night. He's a man of status, but he's cautious, and and Jesus talks to him about the ultimate status change to becoming a dearly loved child of God. And then last week, it's not someone coming to Jesus, but Jesus going to someone, the Samaritan woman that he meets at the well, a woman that society has discarded and marginalized and sort of said, oh, you're not worthy, and Jesus decides to open her eyes to see him. And today we're going to meet someone that's a little bit different. It it wasn't that she came to Jesus and it wasn't that he came to her. Rather, she was brought against her will to Jesus. It's It's the story of Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. And so if you've got a Bible in John 8, you can turn there on your phones or whatever or follow on the screens. I want to read just the first six verses again. And Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and early in the morning he returned to the temple. And all the people gathered around him, and he sat down and taught them. And the legal experts and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, placing her in the center of the group. You can see, you can feel the shame of this moment, the embarrassment. And they said to to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. And in the law, Moses commanded us to stone women like this. What do you say? And if you think it sounds like a trap, It is indeed a trap. Verse 6, they said this to test him because they wanted a reason to bring an accusation against him. And then Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground with his finger. One of the things we see in this story is it's framed as a trap. It's set up to be a trap. And there's this dilemma here. They're saying, okay, Jesus, what's it going to be? And it could be that the trap was uphold the law of Moses or uphold the law of Rome, which didn't allow private stonings. Or, more maybe closer to something we can relate to, the dilemma, the trap that they're laying before Jesus is, are you going to ignore the sin or are you going to ignore the human being? Are you going to ignore this wonderful, precious person or are you going to ignore the the moral standard? Now, all of a sudden, that sounds like a dilemma we're familiar with. It sounds like a dilemma that maybe if you've been around church even just a little bit, your impressions of Christians are we don't know how to sort this out. And so sometimes you'll hear Christians who are like really heavy and say, this is sin and sin and sin, and let's just call it out, and we're tough on sin, but also hard on people. 
Or, or maybe you, you've been around, you've seen it the other way around, and it's like, oh, it's okay, God loves you, it's fine, and we don't need to talk about how you live, and we're really good for people, but we don't talk at all about how we're meant to live. And sometimes Christians try to resolve this, and so we come up with these clever phrases. Have you heard, hate the sin, but love the sinner? Not awful, but something's not quite right about that, isn't it? I mean, we hear people say, no, 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 I hate the sin, but I love the sinner, and we want to say, then why do you sound so angry? Right? So something doesn't seem to fit. And we're going to see Jesus in this story, ninja that he is, offering a different option altogether. But before we get to Jesus, we have to deal with, I think, the elephant in the room for all of us. Because if you're honest, and can I say, articulate something for you that maybe you are feeling? If we're honest, we say, well, here we go again. Christians talking about their fussy sexual rules, these prudish, weird, puritanical, old-fashioned, outdated ugh, killjoys. And you're like, really? Can I say that? Yeah, you can say that. Because that's the impression that we get. And so here we go. Here's another story about sexual sin. And you're like, oh, who cares? Why do we have to talk about this? So can I take a few minutes and unpack this for you a little bit? Why? Christians have to take this seriously. Can I do that? Is that all right? Sure. You're like, oh, okay, what choice do I have? You got the mic. I want to just give you, I just want to give you the headline and then we'll unpack it. In short, Christians care about sex because Christians have a high view of the body. Now, maybe you're like, well, that's news to me. Christians care about bodies? Didn't know that because where's that when there's hungry people to be fed and, uh, and people whose bodies are being beaten? That uh, What do you mean Christians care about bodies? It seems like all I ever hear Christians talking about is souls getting saved and flying away to heaven. No, no, no. Actually, if we were to read our Bibles carefully, we would know that it opens with the story of creation. And creation is the story of God making human beings with bodies. And calling it good. Wouldn't you have thought if God hated bodies, he wouldn't have made them? Like if he had a chance to, to make this from scratch, like make anything. Why not make us flee, free floating spirit beings? And he says, I'm going to make bodies and I'm going to breathe my spirit into them. And all of it together, body, every part of their physicality and their spirituality and emotional and, and mind and every part of who the human being is, intellectual, physical, emotional, spiritual. I'm going to say that is the image of God and it is good. And so we see in creation that bodies matter to God, but that's not all. We know that after that, bodies are the place where we feel our brokenness. After the fall, God says to them, oh, you're going to experience pain now. And bodies are going to break and suffer and sweat. Every time you sweat, be like, that's the fall, man. That's the fall. Because otherwise we could enjoy an 80 degree Friday afternoon at the beach and not come away smelling bad. Right, so bodies feel the effects of the fall, but then Jesus comes. Now, if Jesus thought that the fall had ruined bodies so much, he wouldn't have come in a body. He would have come and been like a floating spaceman. Oh, this is terrible. Come away to my place later like an alien. But he doesn't do that. Jesus, John's gospel says the word became flesh. In, in, in Christian doctrine, we call it the doctrine of creation, but now the doctrine of the incarnation, where Jesus takes on flesh and blood, becomes a body as a way of saying, I didn't give up on re redeeming and rescuing bodies. And then when Jesus goes through the horrific th experience of the death on the cross of Calvary, the worst day in human history, God doesn't answer it by saying, wow, that escalated quickly. That whole cross thing, let's just get you out of here. He raises Jesus up and gives him a glorified resurrection body. You notice, and we said this on Easter when the disciples came, they didn't find a vacated body in the tomb as if like a, it was like a snake shedding its skin. They found an empty tomb, and when they saw Jesus, they saw a Jesus whose body had been transformed, a Jesus who was eating fish and drinking liquids, and, and a Jesus who was having breakfast with them, a Jesus who warmed them by the fire, and yet a Jesus who had a body that somehow could appear in rooms with locked doors. You're like, something's not the same about your body, but it's still a body that could be touched with wounds. So creation, incarnation, resurrection, this is in a nutshell why Christians ought to have a high view of the body. 
why Christians historically have such a high view of the body. Now, now listen to how Paul, one of the first early church planters, connects these two things. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 13. He says, the body isn't for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And you're like, uh-oh. And then he carries on. And the Lord is for the body. Isn't that amazing? God is for our bodies. He's for the redemption and restoration of our bodies. And then he says, God raised the Lord and will raise us up through his power. It's not just Jesus who has been raised from the dead, but all of us who believe in Christ. Yesterday, we had a memorial service in here for Chris Parks, and that was the hope that we were able to give to the room, is to say our hope is not just that we're going to be with Jesus. Our hope is that our bodies will be raised up with God one day. Now catch this. The very next line, avoid sexual immorality. That that is a bizarre thing, right? Don't raise your hands, but has anybody ever heard a sermon that connects bodily resurrection and sexual purity? Or sexual immorality? No, I've never heard that sermon. But Paul preached that sermon. Paul connected it. He said, because God is going to raise up your body, that's why we want to live rightly in our bodies. And he goes on. He says, every sin that a person can do is committed outside the body. There's violence. There's things that we can do that's outside the body. But except those who engage in sexual immorality. And he says this, they commit sins against their own bodies. I want you to hear the tenderness that Paul is speaking with here. He's saying this is not some fussy, arbitrary, outdated, old-fashioned moral code. This is a way that you do violence to the very thing that God counts as holy and sacred. Your body is more valuable than you thought. Your body is more holy than you thought. And every time we engage in something like this, Paul's saying you're actually sinning against your own body. And he says, don't you know? Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Don't you know that you have the Holy Spirit from God? And don't you know that you don't belong to yourself? Don't you know that you've been bought and paid for? Therefore, he says it again, honor God with your body. The idea of this vision of sexual morality is connected to a high view of the body. And you're like, well, I mean, really? Yeah. In fact, Paul will go the very next chapter, 1 Corinthians 7. He'll talk about marriage. And he'll talk about how sex within a marriage is a powerful way of unifying a couple, of dignifying a person, and even, yes, of glorifying God. But the Bible also knows how sex and bodies can actually be mistreated, doesn't it? Anyone, anyone who has tried to read through the Bible will come across those stories very quickly. You're like, ooh, that, that's, that's not a good story. It's not a good story. And so God knows that what we do is the effects of sin is we have brokenness in our sexuality and we have harm in the body. Brokenness in our bodies, not just in our self, but in what, how we treat others. And so we read throughout the Bible stories of people mistreating one another and abusing one another, bodies and sex being misused. Even in this very story in John 8, the Pharisees are using this woman's body as a prop for a point that they are trying to make. They're trying to trap Jesus, but who is caught in this? It's her, this beautiful, precious life. Now, I know that when you hear this, you're still like, okay, Glenn, okay, okay, a little bit of theology, very nerdy, but I'm still not convinced. I still think that this is so archaic and out there, like, why can we just relax already about what we do with our body? You know, it's interesting because we, we, we hear this against the backdrop of our day, and we're like, ugh, so offensive. But what if we heard it against the backdrop of the first century? You see, in Paul's day, there were philosophers who said the body and the spirit are totally disconnected. And so one, one philosopher said, you, you don't actually have to worry about what you do in the body. Eat, drink, and be merry. It doesn't matter. Another philosopher said, oh, yeah, that's why you should actually be ultra-disciplined in your body. And Paul's like, no, it's neither of those things. In fact, I want to show you a quote, and this is, this is a little bit delicate. You, 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 you might find some of these phrases upsetting. I just want to warn you of that. But this is from a Greek philosopher 400 years before the time of Jesus, a man named Demosthenes. And he says this. He says, mistresses we keep for our pleasure, concubines for the daily care of our persons. That's an, a euphemism. 
but wives to bear us legitimate children and to be faithful guardians of our household. This is not some tucked away note somewhere from some obscure, this is not like scrolling through someone's Twitter and finding an old tweet. This is like mainstream Greek philosophy where they said, no, this is how men treat women's bodies. And it's offensive as it should be. But maybe the question is to ask, and how did it come to be offensive? How did we come to recognize that behavior as wrong? Tom Holland, not Spider-Man. There's a secular British historian named Tom Holland. I know I have to qualify that because you're going to see this quote and you're like, wow, Spider-Man is so wise. (laughs) With great power comes great response. No. A few years ago, this secular British historian named Tom Holland wrote this book called Dominion about the influence of Christian thought on the Western world. And he said this. He said, a sexual order rooted in the assumption That any man in a position of power had the right to exploit his inferiors, to use, and I've edited this out for us on a Sunday, to use a slave or a prostitute to relieve his needs. Any order, any system like that, he says, had been ended. How did it end? Because of Paul. Because Paul's insistence that the body of every human being was a vessel, a temple of the Holy Spirit, that view had triumphed. And here's the last sentence. Instincts taken for granted by the Romans had been recast as sin. Now think about this for a moment. Because here we are in 2023 in Southern California. The word sin is not a word we like to use in daily conversation. Like, ah, sin. So religious. So moralistic. But sometimes when we encounter something that is so wrong, we're stretching for the, for the language for it. Kit did it this morning talking about terrorism. He said the, the, the word we're looking for is evil. When we talk about terrorism, that's correct. And what Paul is saying, an order that is built on a system that allows bodies to be undervalued, that allows for bodies to be treated like they're cheap. And you you might point to Rome and say, well, we're not doing that. That's true, but we have pornography. We have hookup culture. We have casual sex that is a way of saying, who cares? And all along the way, God's saying, I do. I care because your body is more valuable than that. Your body is holier than that. And sometimes we're meant to use this word sin as a way of saying there's no other way to name this except sin. So our summary is the headline we started with, sex matters to God because bodies matter to God. And now we're able to come back to this story and see why it's a real dilemma. Because we can't Say Jesus, we can't have Jesus say, oh, it doesn't matter. Actually, what Moses said about sex was so outdated. That's so Moses. Uh, Isn't that just like Moses? Like, I'm here. I'm cool. I'm the fun uncle, you know. We we know that if, if Jesus were to say that, he would be saying to this woman, your body doesn't matter. But he loves her enough to say to her, your body matters, and so I've got to but I've got to handle the situation. And so our question before us this morning is, what does Jesus do when he finds us caught? As all of us will be at some point or have been at some point caught in some kind of, and maybe broaden that out, maybe it's not sexual sin, but some kind of pattern that is destructive and harmful to even our body. And I want to point out three things today. John 8, verse 7, they continued to question him, and so he stood up. And replied, whoever hasn't sinned should throw the first stone. And bending down again, he wrote on the ground, and those who heard him went away one by one, beginning with the elders. I love that little detail that John throws in. Basically, those who had lived, in, who had lived the longest walked away first. Because they're like, yeah, okay, yeah, no, yeah. All the young people are like, we don't sin, you know. The, the people who've lived like a lot of years are like, yeah, I'm not going to lie about this. Finally, only Jesus and the woman were left in the middle of the crowd. What does Jesus do when he finds me, when he finds you caught? The first thing he does is Jesus knows that we're all guilty. Jesus knows that we're all guilty. See, they want him to either minimize the sin or dismiss the woman, but Jesus doesn't minimize the sin. He universalizes the guilt That's the amazing move that he makes. Instead of saying, ah, it's not that big of a deal, he says, no, well, which one of you hasn't? He says, if you want to talk about sin, let's talk about it, but let's talk about yours. Reminds me of the story of a friend of mine who's a pastor. He said someone came up to him one day after church. He goes, pastor, I love your sermons. They're all great, but when are you going to start preaching about sin? 
And, and, and this guy goes, he goes, oh, that's great. He goes, you know what, tell me this. Why don't you email me all of your sins, and I'll preach on them next week. <laughs> and the guy was like, I'm sorry? He goes, you want me to preach on sins? So I just need to know, what are yours? And the guy was like, he, you know, walked away sad. <laughs> Because this is what we do when we say, come on, Lord, deal with sin. What we mean is deal with their sin. And they come to Jesus saying, Jesus, are you soft on sin? He's like, no, I, I'm pretty tough, but can, can, can we talk about all of your sin? Like, like let's uni universalize the guilt. He, Jesus knows that we're all guilty. This, is, I think, is John, John's Gospel's version of what Matthew says in Matthew 7, where Jesus said, don't obsess about the speck in someone else's eye and ignore the plank in your own. Where, where are you guilty? How am I in my own appetites or relationships to things or people or stuff, stuff that's physical or bodily or sexual, how am I disordered in some way? How am I out of order? In... August of 2000, I, I left the college town. I had a job there for a year and, and moved to Colorado Springs and moved to start working at this church that I had fallen in love with. And I had, one of the reasons I'd fallen in love with this church in Colorado was because uh, I had seen that pastor help restore or actually help a church heal in the midst of a moral failure in the, the previous summer, in that summer of 2000. And so I thought, well, wow, that's so sad, but I'm so glad I'm going to go work for a guy who, uh, you know, he restores churches. You know, he helps churches heal after moral failures. Well, six years into the time there, that pastor, the founding pastor of that church in Colorado Springs, was caught in an epic moral failure, sexual sin. And I remember just as a young 20-something just being rocked by that and thinking, what? How? And very quickly in times of prayer, I felt the Holy Spirit shift my own heart and just say, stop putting the searchlight or the spotlight on someone else's sin and start to allow the searchlight into your own heart. And I, can I say that as a young 20-something, I had my own destructive, addictive patterns that I'd say, oh, uh, okay, so what, can we talk about his sin? He's like, I want to talk about your sin. But, but I want to talk about his sin. He's like, I want to talk about your sin. Turn the spotlight on someone else's sin into the searchlight on your own. But you know what I love about Jesus is even as he knows that we're guilty, look at his bodily posture. We're talking about bodies today. John, John says the word became flesh. Listen to this. In verse 6, it, it says that Jesus bent down to write on the ground. And then bending down again, verse 8, he wrote, what's with this posture? Maybe the woman has been dragged in front of the crowd and she's, she's on the ground. And maybe Jesus, knowing that she's caught, but wanting to say that we're all caught, Jesus bends down and meets her in the middle of that shame. He bends down to meet her. The second thing that happens as we keep reading in the story, verse 10, it says, Then Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Is there no one to condemn you? And she said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Do you know how remarkable this is? I don't know what your vision of Jesus is. But maybe it's a vision where if you said, if Jesus saw me in my worst moment, if Jesus saw my internet history, if Jesus knew the text I had sent, if Jesus saw what I said under my breath, if Jesus knew my worst thoughts in my heart, surely he would condemn me. But the Gospels show us another picture. Jesus, the second observation, Jesus forgives Jesus forgives. This is earth shattering. The most explosive choice in the force in the universe is the forgiveness of God. Jesus decides to forgive. Uh, I, I have four kids, three daughters, older two are teenagers. And over the last 10 years or so, it's become very clear that they all love musicals. And so I love musicals now, you know, and I do, and they're fun, and we try to, you know, like, I'm always trying to get them to say, hey, do you want to go watch a ball game at the, we could drive up, and they're like, no, why do we want to do that, you know? So I think live sports are fun, and they are, but they're like, let's all go get tickets to go see this musical. I'm like, okay, and I, I've, I've come to love it. And a few years ago, we were able to go see Hamilton live. This is still when we were in Colorado, and we were able to see Hamilton live in Denver. Anybody ever seen Hamilton, at least on Disney Plus? I watched it on Disney Plus with the subtitles. Don't judge me. I'm just old, that's all. But I was prepared. I knew the lyrics. I knew all the stuff. But nothing prepared me for the experience of being in the theater. 
If you know the story, you know there's a scene where Hamilton himself is caught in his own sort of failure, and he ends up going public with it, and it's a huge embarrassment, and they move uptown. And that song, It's Quiet Uptown, <laughs> comes shortly after Eliza has sung this whole story, a song about burn, what, like wanting to burn it all. You, you've burned our future. And she's talking, talk, it's just the most beautifully poignant song about her betrayal, the feeling of betrayal. And then it's the song, Quiet Uptown. And it says, if you see him walking in the street, have pity, they're going through the unimaginable. And you feel the emotion. Oh, they're going through the unimaginable. And the song goes and it goes. And it comes to this one moment toward the end of the song where the music gets real quiet. And it says, and Eliza took him by the hand. And the piano goes, ding. And then the voices sing, forgiveness, can you imagine? And you're like, oh. And I sat in the, and I just broke. And I started weeping. And I look around and everyone's going, <laughs> I'm like, are we in church? Like, is this an evangelistic crusade, you know? But everybody knows at a human level, forgiveness is the most powerful force in the world, isn't it? When somebody, somebody's failed you, because we've all, we've all failed somebody. We've all failed somebody. The only way marriages last, the only way friendships last, the only way churches last is if we can unleash the power of forgiveness. And in that moment... Jesus says to her, neither do I condemn you. And you can feel the silence of the moment. But, you know, for Jesus, forgiveness is not because he just decided not to worry about it. What else does John tell us? John 1 verse 29 says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When Jesus forgives, it's not because he decided not to care. It's because he decided to suffer and die. For us, he forgives because he forgives with the shedding of his own blood. First John is a letter that maybe was written to these communities that were shaped by John himself, maybe planted by John himself. And First John 1 8 says it this way it says, But if we live in the light, in the same way that he is in the light, we have fellowship with each other. We've got to be able to confess, we've got to be able to be honest, we've got to be able to forgive. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from every sin. He doesn't say we can have fellowship with one another when you find the perfect small group. He doesn't say we can have fellowship with one another if you marry the right person. He, he says, listen, the only thing that makes this work is the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from every sin. And if we claim, well, we don't have sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from everything we've done wrong. Somebody shout amen. amen. Like, isn't that the best news ever? And then he says, if we claim, just in case again you're embarrassed, if we claim we've never sinned, and usually what we mean is, well, I've never done that. We make him a liar and his word is not in us. Then hear the tenderness here. My little children. I'm writing these things to you so that you don't sin. I, I want you to live without it. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, he is God's way of dealing with our sins, and not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. If you had a paper Bible, you should circle, underline, whatever that word advocate over and over again. Because how many times do we think Jesus is going to meet you in your worst moment as the judge? Jesus will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. That's coming. But you know what's the best part? How does he come before he comes as judge? He comes as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. He comes as the advocate and your defender. And only then does he come to judge because now he can offer you the verdict that says, innocent, righteous, not guilty, because it was my blood that paid for it, and I am defending them. And so their verdict on your life is going to be no condemnation. That's amazing news. That's amazing news. Jesus comes as advocate. Look at her posture, his posture again, verse 7. When they questioned him, he stood up. Verse 10, Jesus stood up and said to her. He bends down to meet her in her shame, but he stands up for her because he's forgiven her. I need you to know, church, that in your darkest hour, in your worst moments, when you're most embarrassed, that Jesus is standing up for you. There may be other voices that condemn you. There may be other voices that accuse you. But Jesus isn't going to be one of them. 
He's bent low to meet you in that shame, and then he stands up for you to say, no, 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 this one's mine. The story goes on, and it ends with this remarkable verse. Verse 11, she said, no one, sir, and Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, don't sin anymore. Now, if I was saying that, it would just be good advice. And if you were saying that, it might sound like a lecture. And if a parent or a teacher says, now don't do that again, it may sound like a warning. But when Jesus says it, it's different. You know why? Because John tells us that Jesus is the word of God. John tells us that Jesus is the word through whom all things were made. Are you kidding me? Are you, you're saying that Jesus is the one that called light out of darkness, that called life out of death. Jesus is the very word of God that has creative power. And so when Jesus speaks, it's not good advice. It's a new reality. It's a new life. And Jesus says to her, go and sin no more. It's not a warning. It's not, it's not a lesson. It's a word of transformation. And that's our third and final observation from the story is Jesus actually gives us the power to be different. He actually gives us the power to be different. John also says, not only is Jesus the word, but John says Jesus is the giver of the spirit. See, Moses could give us moral clarity with the law, but he couldn't give us personal power. And Jesus says, I'm not going to undo the moral clarity of the law. There's something about that that we're supposed to uphold, but I'm going to do better than moral clarity. I'm going to give you personal power, the power of the Holy Spirit to actually be different. Now, hear me for a moment, just as a pastoral word. If it took five years to fall into a destructive pattern, it could take five years to become free of it. Not everybody's journey is a journey of instant overnight, and I want to say that to you. Yesterday, one of the remarkable things of the funeral, I walked in, and there was a group from AA meeting down the hall, and then I walked in the room, and there was a massive community of a different recovery group that was here because they were connected to Chris. I met a woman who flew in from Boston and said, uh, Chris has been my sponsor for 20 years. I've been sober for 20 years because of her love of Jesus that she lived out and showed to me. The journey of freedom may take time, but it's Jesus who gives us the power to be different. It's Jesus who gives us the power to say the harm done to you will not be done to others. You can actually break the cycle. You can actually break the cycle of sin and shame. See, here's the beautiful thing about the gospel. If the best Jesus was offering us was acceptance, it would not actually be good news. If the best Jesus was offering us was advice, it would not be good news. But that's kind of what we have in our world today, isn't it? We've got acceptance, people who say, don't worry, don't make a big deal, just love yourself, you're awesome, you're the best. And inside we're like, but I know I'm not. That's not what my roommate just told me. It doesn't work. Acceptance isn't enough. Advice is certainly not enough, but the gospel is good news because it's an announcement. It's not acceptance or advice. It's an announcement that Jesus has come to us and met us in our shame and forgiven us and given us the power to become different. What is it we're really longing for when we're caught in sin? We're really longing for forgiveness and we're really longing for freedom. And that is what Jesus brings. Hate the sin and love the sinner? No. Jesus says, how about I forgive the sin and transform the sinner? That's the good news of the gospel. So would you stand with me this morning as the worship team comes? Sorry for taking a bit of extra time this morning. You didn't know you were going to get a bit of theology of the body when we were studying John 8, but here we are. <laughs> um, listen, I... I know that this is tender, and I want to make space for this. We're about to come to the table of the Lord. And Jesus' table is a place of gentleness. It's a place of mercy. It's a place of grace. And I want you to hear me say this. Jesus has made a seat for you ready at his table. So maybe some of you are like, no, not me. I'm too embarrassed. I'm too ashamed. I've violated all those things you've talked about. Now Jesus has made a seat for you available at his table. And we're about to say in a moment when you get these elements, the body of Christ given for you to rescue and redeem your body. The blood of Christ shed for you to 
forgive and cleanse your sin. So all over the room, would you just kind of open up your hands like this? take a moment. The woman was dragged against her will to meet Jesus, but it ended up being the most life-changing encounter. But today, you don't have to be dragged to Jesus. You can just come to Jesus. Just come. Maybe for some of you, it's the first time ever. You're, you're, you're like, I'm going to try this church thing. And you're like, wow, I've never known Jesus like this. Maybe today is a moment to begin your journey of following Jesus, this can be day one. Maybe for the rest of us who say, Jesus, I just need more forgiveness. I really just need more freedom. I'm struggling. I feel like I'm two steps forward, one step back. That's probably all of us, isn't it? And today we can receive that grace, that power, that spirit of the living God. pray this old prayer of confession over us as a way of including us in all of us. So most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We're truly sorry. We humbly repent. Now for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. That we might delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of God the Father. Amen. So Lord, we receive your forgiveness. We receive your mercy again. Lord, as we come to receive the body and the blood, let your grace wash over us, forgiving us, freeing us. In Jesus' name. I'd like to invite the communion servers to come and come to the stations right now and get the elements ready. And then as we sing, you can come and receive.